Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, chapter 19, uh, beginning with verse 16. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, please go back and watch it from the beginning. John is the most important book in the Bible. All right, now I'm a KJV firstist. So I'm going to read it first in the KJV. But oftentimes I find that looking at it in another translation can be helpful. The one I like is the Amplified. Because the Amplified is, it's, it's kind of a, a translation and a commentary blended together. So I may look at it also in the Amplified uh, and uh, it, it may be helpful to us. Okay, so let's begin. John chapter 19, verse 16. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Now, the, the scriptures talk about Jesus being scourged, and a crown of thorns, and being uh, struck in the face, and being crucified but that's all it says it doesn't it doesn't explain the the details of all those things uh in the last study i did uh, attempt to go into more detail explaining the severity uh, graphic details on what all that meant uh, but I do have a playlist titled uh, Crucifixion. And so uh, I think it is important for us to understand the depth of suffering Jesus endured for us. So if you can handle it, watch my playlist on Crucifixion and you'll understand how horrible this really is because the, the, the Bible doesn't explain it. But if we study history, we learn, you know, exactly what it is, and 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 the 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 degree of suffering is so enormous that uh, I think we owe it. We owe it to him. There's another thing. There's a a book I've recommended many times over the years called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and this is a a similar point that. Throughout history, uh, Christians have suffered imprisonment, torture, and horrible deaths because of their faith in Jesus. And that book goes into graphic detail accounting these uh, the sufferings of the martyrs. And I think we owe it to the martyrs, and we owe it to Jesus to carefully look at exactly what it meant to be crucified, what it, what it meant to to be to suffer as they did. Jesus suffered for our sake. The martyrs suffered because of their faith in Jesus. All right, uh, I'm not going to uh, go into great detail now, but uh, you can go to my play, The Crucifixion, and you can wa watch the previous video on this study, John, and uh, I do go into more detail there, but I don't feel the need to repeat it again now. Verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, 
write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Pontius Pilate is a really very interesting historical figure. Obviously very significant because of his role in Jesus' death sentence and crucifixion. And also his role in him releasing the body and, and uh, his, uh, giving permission to uh, Joseph of Arimathea to take his body. Well, all these things are significant in Pontius Pilate he did not want to give a guilty verdict. In fact, he never did give a guilty verdict. He just gave in to the pressure, the political pressure that the Jews placed on him. And he, he washed his hands because he, indicating that uh, he did not want to be uh, uh, held responsible for what was going to happen next. And in fact, the Jews claimed that they would be wanted to be held responsible. They said, let his, his blood, his death be on, on us and our children. And some people use that to hate the Jews and to be anti-Semitic. And they've done it for two centuries. I mean, 20 centuries. But... Uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, he did have principles too, and he, I think, it, I can at least respect the fact that he stood up to them in, in verse 21. They told him to change the inscription to, he said, I am king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate refused to change it. He left it as it was originally written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So um, I was happy. Uh, I'm happy that he did not give in to the pressure, at least on that point. Uh, so was he King of the Jews? Um, he never claimed to be King of the Jews. People wanted to make him King. They wanted to they believed that the Messiah would follow the succession from uh, from King David. The scriptures say that the Messiah would come through a, a succession of um, in, in, of genealogy from Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Jesse, Judah, David. The Messiah had to come from that family line. So, in a way, he was it was succession, a, a royal succession of kings. Um, but he never claimed to be king of, of the Jews, and people today are divided over this dispensationalism and the millennium, and, and there's a bit differing uh, viewpoints on how to understand the scriptures about about these things and uh, some people believe that he is he came to be king he was rejected so when he comes again he'll set up a kingdom be a king for a thousand years but uh if you want to you can watch my playlist uh, dispensationalism millennialism uh, futurism preterism and you can see uh the various viewpoints on, on eschatology, and you can see how, you know, my conclusions on this subject. But uh, Jesus didn't say he was king of the Jews, but it said above his, above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Let me read this portion in the Amplified, see if it can be helpful. Starting with verse 16. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called 
the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription on the placard and put it on the cross, and it was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews. But he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. It remains written. Well, one thing that stands out to me, I think it's is uh, um, fascinating is that um, it's, I have a playlist called um, The Bloody Trail and it, it I, I start in Genesis and go through the whole Bible of the Old Testament and, and show all the things that the, um, theologians would refer to as the pictures and shadows of uh, uh, Jesus Jesus is uh, coming and death, burial, and resurrection. Um, there's there's so many events, so many things that happen in the Old Testament that are pictures of these events. Uh, they didn't understand them at the time in the way we could, you know, as they were happening. There's a saying that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Within the Old Testament, we can see all the things that would happen in the New Testament that's concealed there. But the people who were observing at the time didn't get it. It's like they couldn't see the forest for the trees. Um, but the saying goes on to say that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We have the New Testament. As we study it, we can see things in the Old Testament that were pictures of things to come that we can understand now in hindsight. And one of these things is when there was a battle going on, I, and with Moses was the leader, and he had, uh, I think it was Joshua and Aaron um, with him. And as the battle was going on, Moses stood and he held his hands up like this. And as long as his hands were up, his side was winning the battle. As he got tired and his hands would come down, his side would lose the battle. So Aaron, I think it was Aaron and Joshua, were on each side of him and they were holding his arms up. And this is, this is uh, I can see it as a picture of uh, Moses representing Jesus in this position of the, crucif uh, the cross. And Aaron and Joshua on each side, holding up his arms, but right there, and it's a picture of Jesus and the two thieves. Uh, so, if you're interested in that, go to that playlist, Pictures and Shadows, uh, no, or uh, The Bloody Trail. Verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let's not rend it, but cast lots for it, the, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my remnant. Uh, among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Uh, an example of probably 300, I believe there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus' life, uh, death, burial, resurrection. Uh, this actually says here in the scriptures that you can go back into the prophets and you can see that they wrote about this they predicted it would happen let me see if there's a footnote telling me where that is there's 24 uh, 
there's not a footnote here, but, but from my memory, I would say you could find this prophecy in either Isaiah 53 or um, 20, Psalm 22. If you read those chapters, you'll see that these are prophecies about the, the suffering death of Jesus. And it's, it's very detailed. And the, the prophecies in the Bible are clear, precise uh, descriptions of future events. Don't confuse them with prophecies of these, uh, the, from these false prophets that people like to cite, like Nostradamus, and Gene Dixon, and Edgar Casey. And their pro prophecies were broad and general and, and inaccurate. They had proven wrong over and over again. There's no prophecies in the Bible that have been proven wrong. There are some that are, have not been fulfilled up to yet, but none of them have been wrong. So, uh, in this case, the prophecy was that uh, his his clothing, his, prop, his belongings would be divided up, and they would draw lots or gamble for the, the vesture or the coat. Let me read that in the Amplified. Let's see how it phrases it. It says, um, so they said one to, oh, no, verse 23, it said, starting with verse 23. Oh, no. Yeah, verse tw starting with verse 23 in the Amplified. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer clothes and made four parts a part for each soldier, and also the tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top throughout. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it will be. This was to fulfill the scriptures. Now, um, this part I read up to that point was is, uh, with the quoting the, the words of the soldiers, but Starting here, this is not a quote from the scroll soldiers. This, the soldiers do not are not actually saying this was to fulfill the scriptures. They, the soldiers didn't have any idea what they were doing was fulfilling prophecy. But in the scripture here, it says this was to fulfill the scripture. And I said, as I said, you'll find that in Isaiah or the Psalms. They divided my outer clothing among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Now, back to the KJV. Uh, verse 25. Uh, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas. Hmm. That's interesting. That's the very first time I've ever noticed the second Mary was Mary's sister, the the aunt of of Jesus. I knew there there were two Marys and John. Oh no, there's three Marys here. It says in the first I'll continue reading the verse. So now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Hmm. I didn't. It didn't ever register to me that there were three Marys there. I I thought there were two Marys, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Jesus. But there's another Mary who's also the sister, the the wife of Cleophas, oh, and his mother sister. Um, G, G, that's very odd. It says now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. His mother's name is Mary and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas. It seems that Mary and her sister both had the name Mary. That's very odd. And Mary Magdalene. So there are three Marys there. Then Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple standing by. The disciple is unnamed here. It is the writer of the book of John, the apostle John. I've said this before, but... Um, the uh, more more of the prophecies about uh, G, uh, Jesus um, 
One of them is that, that uh, they would, um, he would be abandoned by his followers, by his disciples. And sure enough, they all abandoned him, except for John. John's the only one that was there uh, during the arrest, the trial, the, the, the crucifixion. And uh, maybe that's why John is referred to as the beloved apostle. And Jesus had a, a special affection for him. Jesus probably knew that John would not uh, abandon him. So you've got three Marys and John at the cross. Verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Now, that strikes me as odd also, uh, because um, at this point Mary must have been a widow. There's no reference to Joseph at all. Um, but we do know that uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, want to argue that they were just uh, step stepchildren. They were not uh, uh, blood related to Jesus. They were the children of Joseph from a previous marriage. But that's just to defend their false doctrine that uh, Mary was the, um, uh, remained a virgin her whole life. Uh, but the scriptures say that, uh, uh, tell us that no, she did have children. Uh, our uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. And we know that two of them uh, are giving credit for writing two of the books of the Bible, the book of James and the, the, uh, the book of Jude. These were brothers of Jesus. Uh, it's commonly believed that his brothers wrote those books. Uh, so my, my question is, and if you're watching this now and you have insights that could be helpful to me, I wonder why um, Jesus would delegate responsibility to John and John to be uh, take care of his mother the way it, it, it's described here he says he says uh, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved he saith unto his mother woman behold thy son so he's telling his mother Mary to, to, to consider John as his her son and then he tells John then he saith to the disciple behold thy mother so he's, he's asking John to consider Mary his mother and be responsible for her and then it says and from that hour that disciple took her into his own home I just wonder why James and Jude didn't take Mary into their home if you have any idea on that, let me know. Uh, let me read this in the Amplified now. Um, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Salome, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, Clopas, and, and Mary Magdalene. Hmm. Uh, the way that's explaining it is it, it says that by but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, that's one, his mother's sister, Salome, that's two, Mary, the wife of Clopas, that's three, and Mary Magdalene, that's four. So this, in the Amplified, it's giving me the impression there are four women, three Marys and Salome. So there, this is saying that Mary's sister's name was Salome. Let me look at that and see if there's a footnote here. And footnote K. The mother of the apostles John and James, the sons of Zebedee. Okay, so John 
the Apostle John, his mother was this uh, other woman there, according to the Amplified. And her name was Salome. So I'm going to read that again in the Amplified, I mean, KJV, to compare that. Verse 25. And the other stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister. Okay. Yeah. I can see it's just a question of the punctuation and how I, I, I misunderstood this, but I'm glad that the Amplified, see here's an example of the Amplified being very helpful. So he says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, and I thought that this next point was referring to this per same person, Mary, the wife of Cleophas. But the way this should be understood is, uh, there stood by the the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Salome, and also Mary, the wife of Cleopas, who, and, and, and then also Mary Magdalene. Um, so back to the Amplified, and continue there, it says, So Jesus, seeing his mother, and the disciple whom he loved, esteemed, standing near, said to his mother, Dear woman, look, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple John, Look, here is your mother. Protect and provide for her. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. All right, so uh, well, it all makes sense, except why is John given the responsibility of caring for Mary when Mary has other children, including James and Jude? Tell me if you have an answer. Uh, now let's go to verse 28 the KJV. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And now again, it says, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So there must be a, a statement in Psalm 23 or Isaiah 53, I'm sorry, Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53, there must be a statement in there about this vinegar and gall and this thirsting. Uh, and then verse 29, now there was a, was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Now this is portrayed in the movies like a stick with a sponge on the end of it. They put it there and Jesus can drink from the sponge. That uh, It says hyssop. I'll read the Amplified in a minute and see if that helps at all there. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, now in, in other gospel accounts, I don't know if it's Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but it, 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 Jesus also says, uh, Father, into your hands I can commit my spirit. Uh, and it's not stated here. Now, when you find these discrepancies, that don't conclude that there's errors in the Bible. All it is is just uh, four different people uh, giving their account and if, if if three of you in the audience here and myself four of us were to observe things let's say we were together and observing uh, things for three and a half years and then we wrote down our recollection of all those things we wouldn't all write it down exactly the same where each person has their own recollections and they're also their own way of, of uh, explaining it even though the scriptures are inspired and, and that God is speaking through them, there's still a personality. And there's also each one of the gospel accounts has a particular uh, purpose that's different than the others. The gospel of John, the purpose is unique. And in, in chapter 21, I think there's a verse that says, the reason this book is written is to tell you how to receive the gift of eternal life. Uh, so, the book of John is the only book of the whole Bible 
where it states the purpose is to tell you how to get saved. Uh, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that was not the purpose of the writing. The purpose there was a, was, was a historical record of these events. But in John, what's important is we learn about who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Created all things. Nothing was made that was uh, by nothing was made that was except what was made by Him. And, it, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we learn about who Jesus is. He's eternal God Almighty who became a man. And then we also learn that the method, the means of salvation is faith in, in this person, Jesus. Faith in, in who he is and what he's done for us. His death on the cross for our sins. Uh, so when you read the other gospel accounts, the agenda, the purpose of the writing of those books is different than the book of John. So, but here it says, um, when Jesus therefore had received the letter, he said, it is finished to tell us I believe that's the Greek word for it is, it is finished. You know, it is finished is one of the most important statements ever made in the history of the world. It is finished means that he's done everything that was necessary for you to be saved. Nothing else needs to be done. Nothing needs to be done by you. Jesus did it all. He finished everything. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he'll give you credit for his perfect life, if you trust him. He suffered and died and paid for our sins so that you don't have to suffer and die and pay for your sins. And he raised himself from the dead, proving that he is God and he is the Savior. He does have power over life and death. Everything was completed by Jesus Christ that needed to be done for our salvation. So all that's required on our part is to believe that, to believe that he did it all, and that uh, our faith in him is what assures our salvation. Um, let me read these verses in the Amplified. It says, um, Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said in fulfillment of the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine, and the KJV calls it vinegar, so it's sour wine, was placed there. So they put a sponge soaked in the sour wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and voluntarily gave up his spirit. Okay. Verse 30, 31. Um, I think I'll pick up with verse 31 next time. Uh, all right. I want to make sure that you understand when I'm talking about salvation um, before I finish this, uh, this message. Most people in the world uh, have never learned or understood that salvation, eternal life in heaven, is offered to all of mankind, offered by Jesus Christ as a free gift. Most of the world believes that in order to go to heaven, uh, we have to work and strive and, and, and uh, achieve it. And if we, if we do live a, a, a good, really good life, then God might say, well, you did well enough, so your reward is, is heaven. So but what you need to understand is that heaven is not a reward for our good behavior. Heaven is a gift from Jesus Christ to all who put their faith in him. Who all who all, to all who uh, rely on him for salvation instead of thinking that they can earn it through good behavior. So that's what you need to do. You need to change your mind from believing that religion is your answer, and instead believe that Jesus is your answer. A Christian, uh, 
a, a Christian has faith that they are going to heaven because of Jesus. Not because of anything that we've done. Not because of any good things we've done. Not because of our ability to, to stop sinning or not because of our, our, our good works, being charitable and kind and doing good deeds. Not because of that, but because of Jesus. We, we have faith we're going to have it because of Jesus, because of what he did for us. So, if we don't believe in, in going to heaven because of what we do, we, we believe we're going to heaven because of what he did for us. And that's what I'm asking you to do now. Put your faith in Jesus for your salvation. And at that moment, you get the gift of eternal life instantaneously. And the Bible says, not only are you going to heaven, but you never have to worry that God's going to change his mind and take back the gift. Because the Bible says that uh, this gift of salvation and eternal life in heaven, it's a promise from Jesus. And, and the Bible says that God can't break a promise. God cannot lie. So uh, part of having faith in Jesus is, is believing that he's going to be faithful to, to get you to heaven. Believe you're definitely going to go to heaven because Jesus is the one person that has the ability to get you to heaven because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So believe he is the way. He's the one and only way. He's the only one who can get you to heaven. And then believe that he will keep his promise. He is faithful. Have faith in his faithfulness to keep his promise. And then you can have what we call the blessed assurance. You can have such a comfort knowing that you're going to go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. He's eternal God Almighty. He became a man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead bodily. And the bodily resurrection is the sign, the proof, that he is God and our Savior. Put your faith in your mouth. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.